Imagine being removed from your neighborhood, from your community, and kept away for generations. And imagine the thought of coming back home and going back to the old places and putting the home back together again and going back to the place where you worshiped and getting the place back in order again. This was why the party was going on. We read about this, and we see in this text their celebration. This passage is an account of their reaffirmation of allegiance to Torah, to the law of Moses. Men and women assembled together, hello, everybody together, listened as Ezra, the priest, joined by other religious leaders, stood before them and read from Torah for hours. And as Ezra read, others interpreted the passages so that the people who were assembled could understand. Hello? If you have worship and folks don't understand what happened, you didn't have worship. I don't care how loud saying it goes, I don't care how much you rock and roll, I don't care how loud the preacher goes, I don't care how many gymnastics the preacher pulls off, if you don't understand what happened, wasn't worship. It was a heck of a show, but it wasn't worship, all right? <laughs> heck of a show, but it wasn't worship. And in showing how exiled people rejoice before God after they return home, this passage speaks to each of us. Because the truth is that many people feel and live as exiles. Shut out. Cut off separated from a sense of community. Sometimes people are exiled from their families. Family life isn't always pleasant. It isn't always peaceful. It isn't always nurturing. Disagreements can fester into conflicts. Conflicts can grow into disruptions. And disruptions can produce emotional and physical distance. Sometimes people have been exiled from their families. Sometimes people have been made outcasts, shut out, forgotten, even disowned. Oh, so she came out as lesbian or gay, and all of a sudden the family, oh, she had a baby and wasn't married. All the family, pulled away. oh, he got in trouble with the law. Family pulls away. Oh, he became a Muslim, pulled away. Oh, you fill in the blank. And all of a sudden, someone who was part of a community in the family is exiled, shut out. The people in this lesson were political exiles. And their ancestors had been forcibly taken from their homeland to Babylon many years earlier. Over time, the Babylonian Empire had been toppled by the Persian Empire. And the Hebrew exiles lived under Babylonian and Persian rulers, but they always yearned to return home. Do you not recall that psalm? How can we sing the Lord's songs? How can we sing Zion's songs in a strange land? That's what that passage was about. People not home and feeling like we can't feel right singing the songs because we're not home. They were political exiles. There are political exiles among us today. Mass incarceration and the unjust war on drugs, I call it the war on people because the drugs haven't gone to jail. It's war on people. Drugs not in jail. The people are in jail. They're responsible for millions of political exiles in our society because of the war on drugs that we really know as a war on people, men and women have been forcibly removed from their families, 
from their neighborhoods, and in some cases even from the states where they live after being convicted and sentenced to prison terms for possessing and using illegal drugs. Thanks to laws initiated and passed during the administration of President Clinton, I'm not hating, I'm just telling the truth. I'm not hating, I'm just stating. Persons convicted of drug offenses are banned from living in public housing. Prison is public housing, y'all. But under these laws, people who are in public housing in prison cannot go back to public housing even though they don't have a job and they don't have education. And oftentimes, the only family members they know are living in public housing. They're banned from obtaining assistance and government service for education, housing, and employment. They are forcibly and sometimes permanently made exiles from voting from work, communities where they grew up, and the families who nurtured them, exiles. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke of another group of exiles, military veterans and their families. In the speech that politicians and newspaper editors and others deliberately refuse to quote or repeat, speaking to Riverside Church in New York City on April 4th, 1987, 1967, Exactly a year to the day before he was murdered, Dr. King called for a radical revolution of values and said this, quote, a true revolution of values will, call, will lay hands on the world order and say of war, this way of settling differences is not just. This business of burning human beings with napalm, of filling our nation's homes with orphans and widows, of injecting poisonous drugs of hate into veins of people normally humane, of sending men, and I should say women, home from dark and bloody battlefields physically handicapped and psychologically deranged cannot be reconciled with wisdom, justice, and love." Close quote. Violence always produces exiles, and war is violence on a massive scale. War veterans are often physical and emotional exiles. Our homeless, our incarcerated, our chemical dependent brothers and sisters include many war veterans. And their families become exiles, often left only with fading photographs and the pain that comes from having lost contact with loved ones who either lost their lives or their sense of wholeness while at war. Who among us hasn't known a family member who went off to war but the person who came back wasn't whole and never was the same again. They were exiles. We should never speak and think of exiles without including the Palestinian people. Since the modern state of Israel was created in 1948, Palestinians have been forcibly displaced from the land of their ancestors and denied the right to return home. The homes and the lands of displaced Palestinians are, even today, being illegally appropriated and occupied by Jewish settlers. The United States claims to be opposed to Israeli occupation of Palestinian land and mistreatment of Palestinians. However, the Obama administration, like all those before it, refuses to support imposing sanctions against Israel for violating international law about refusing to let exile people return home. You see, international law guarantees the right of exiles to return home. It's morally right to be able to go back home when you've been forced out. It's morally wrong to keep folks who've been forced out of home, away from home. But the Obama administration, like its predecessors, refuses to support resolutions in the United Nations that condemn Israel for denying exiled Palestinians the internationally recognized right of return to their homes. And we should also ask why none of the current contenders to succeed President Obama are talking about this. You haven't heard a word about Israel and the Palestinians during the presidential campaign, have you? Hmm, hello. Why aren't they questioning about it during debates? Hello. 
And why do pastors and religious educators and other faithful people who read and preach and teach about exiles returning home in scripture refuse to realize the contemporary application of those passages for Palestinians? We don't talk about returning home for gay and lesbian people, exiles. We don't talk about returning home for people who are incarcerated, exiles. We don't talk about returning home for our military veterans, exiles. We don't talk about returning home for Palestinians. Who are we talking about returning home? Hello. The history of black people in the Western Hemisphere is a history of exile. Africans were stolen from their families, communities, and continent and shipped across oceans to become slaves and black people in the United States and elsewhere in the Western Hemisphere lost contact with their ancestral, their tribal, and their cultural and other identities. Exile. People can become spiritual exiles. Sin causes us to behave and to think as if we can and should exist disconnected from and independent of God and one another and the creation. Actually, we're kin to the snow. We're part of the creation. We're kin to the birds. We're part of the creation. We're kin to the wind. It's part of the creation. We're kin to all that God has created, but we sometimes, because of sin, think that the weather is our enemy when the weather is just part of what God put us into to be part of God's oneness. We become exiles from nature. We become exiled from each other. We become exiled from ourselves. We become exiles from God. And the theme repeated throughout scripture and affirmed in this text is that God loves and restores exiles. The power of God is on the side of the exiles. The love of God knows and grieves the plight of exiles. And Ezra and Nehemiah in this passage are agents of God's love and God's power and God's determination to restore exiled people as we read about this longest celebration in the Bible. Worship and the people worship God. Worship that is true to God's love and power and purpose in the human experience must always speak to and touch our situation as exiled people. It must touch us where we are in whatever far country we find ourselves, emotionally or spiritually or physically or psychologically or socially or otherwise, it must bring people back into a sense of community and fellowship. Together, exiled people must be welcomed. Together, exiled people must be affirmed. Together, exiled people must be instructed. Together, exiled people must be corrected. Together, exiled people must be encouraged. Together, exiled people must be given a sense that we belong to God. We belong to one another. We belong to God's oneness. None of us must ever come out of worship feeling like we're still exiled. And worship should never make a person feel like they are more exiled in church than they are out of church. And the truth be told, some of our excuses of worship are so hellish that exiled people feel more welcome outside the church door than they do inside the places where folks are singing, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Hello. The 
point I'm trying to say is that worship that does not help us experience a sense of being welcomed home is not true to the love and heart of God. This passage that we read this morning, like the passage of the prodigal son we read about in Luke, ends with joyful celebration. You recall the prodigal son? Daddy throws a big party for the son who's come home. He kills the fatted calf. Brings out the best robe. Has to go outside the party to talk to old big head, older brother, who's so holy, he can't come into the party because he's scared some of the party going to roll up on him. Hello? Worship that is true to God's heart ends with celebration, celebrates being called and brought out of exile from whatever has held us captive. And worship that does not give us a sense of being connected to God and related to each other is not true to the purpose of God. You see, the whole message of scripture is that God is obsessed. I use that word, God is obsessed. Say obsessed. God is obsessed with relationships. God is obsessed with relationships. God wants to heal broken relationships. God wants to heal broken people. God wants us to know that we are divinely connected to God and to one another and to the creation. And to creation, God is obsessed with relationships and worship that does not give us a sense of being connected to God and related to others is not true to the purpose of God because God is hung up. On connection. That's what Calvary is all about. Jesus came and lived and died to bring us into oneness with God because God has just hung up on relationships. And worship that does not teach us to honor God and one another in our relationships is not true to the love of God. You understand, we can't just read scripture. We have to be taught what it means. I love Bible-believing and Bible-toting people, but Bible-believing and Bible-toting people who are hateful need to do something with their Bible besides tote it. <laughs> Worship that does not teach us to honor God and one another in our relationships is not true to the love of God. We must be taught to honor God and taught to honor one another. You see, sin corrupts our moral judgment through our sense of what is valuable is lost. We begin to place more value on property than on people. So we get more hung up over our car getting busted than our relationship getting busted. We need to be taught to value God, to value other persons as children of God and to value the creation as entrusted to humanity by God. And worship that does not encourage us to rejoice. I said rejoice. Say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice in our oneness with God and other persons. And the creation is out of step with the joy of God. You see, God is really joyful. The notion of God being a mean, old, grouchy person, being that's waiting to hammer us is not true to the nature of God. Where in the world we get that idea that God is mean? God is angry. And God doesn't like people. We didn't get it from God. Worship must help us live in joyful fellowship with God. And worship that doesn't encourage us to rejoice in our oneness with God, rejoice in our oneness with other people, rejoice in the creation is out of step with the joy of God. I think it's uniquely wonderful that the first 
miracle we read about in John's gospel is Jesus turning water to wine in the wind. Jesus was a party, making sure they had good wine. Because God loves a good party. Worship must not leave us feeling guilty, shameful, fearful, rejected, and in despair. Worship must bring us into the heart of God and leave us with feelings of being welcomed and rejoiced about. And then we rejoice with each other. In this lesson, Nehemiah and Ezra encouraged the restored community. Perhaps some people wept as the scripture was read and interpreted for them because they felt burdened by feelings of guilt and shame as they read from the law of Moses and, and realized that we haven't been living up to what God wanted us to be. Perhaps some wept because they were overcome and overwhelmed by the promises of God they heard in the readings. When we read about what God has promised and how much God will do for us, it ought to make us feel so full sometimes we shed some tears. But Ezra and Nehemiah didn't leave folks feeling strung out. They encouraged them. That's what the word benediction means, a blessing before you go. A blessing before you go. We are accustomed to hearing a benediction at the close of worship. Notice the benediction in the passage we read. Oh, you didn't catch it? You missed it. You missed the benediction? Oh, I know why you missed it. Look, verse 10. Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine. Y'all saw the wine. You're talking, no, it can't be a benediction. Y'all you, 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 you saw hold it. You can't. You, you, no. Go your way. Benediction, go, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared for this day is holy to our, God, our Lord. Do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Go in peace. Go in joy. Go in gladness. Go in prosperity. Go eat. Go drink sweet wine. Not too much of it, but drink some. But don't just stop there. Go share. Because there are some people, go from the depart, of this, of depart from the assembly and go into the community. Don't hang around here. Uh, I don't have anything in this church, but if worship doesn't get us out of church, we haven't worshiped. Hello? Go. Go into the community and as restored people. Go and feast. Enjoy. Feast. God wants us to enjoy good food. Enjoy good life. When you find church folks who can never find and enjoy, run. <laughs> run from them. In the name of Jesus, run. Go and feast and share with the needy. Be mindful that there are others who have no food, who do not have sweet wine, do not have anyone with whom to share festive moments. Share. And then rejoice as God's holy people. Holiness is not an excuse for being dour. Holiness is a call to joyfulness. If anybody in the world ought to have a license to be joyful, it's folks who have been to worship. And if you come out of worship and you can't find it, if you think about your rheumatism and your arthritis and your coins and your... <laughs> you missed it! Or we missed it! Or we preachers miss it. What are you saying, preacher? Remember the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord. Say it. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Worship that honors God causes us to be strengthened by our devotion to our joyful and joy-giving God. Because God is glad to love us. 
God is glad to call us and deliver us from whatever situation of exile we've known or in. God is glad to bring us home into oneness with God, oneness with one another, and oneness with the creation. God is glad to tell us, you are my people. We are one with God. We are one with one another in God's love. We are one with one another and the creation in God's love and in God's purpose. The constant message of scripture is that we should be hearing and experiencing in worship is that we are God's people. We are not exiles anymore. God has brought us home. And that's the message we have in Jesus Christ. God bringing creation, God bringing humanity, God bringing all the world home. How did Jesus pray it in the 17th John, chapter of John, that high priestly prayer? I pray that they will be one with me, even as I am one with thee. I in you and they in me, that we are one in thee. God has the only math that has one and one and one equals one. But that's heavenly math because God is into oneness. What are you saying, preacher? Preacher, I'm saying God is on a mission to bring us home from every situation of exile or separation that torments us. And that God will make ways for us to be restored. God will give us new joy and new peace and new hope. And this is what we ought to do every time we worship. Affirm that God is bringing us into oneness and calling all people home. This is our strength. Hallelujah. Amen.